everybody for joining us at Sharsharit today for an important conversation about clinical trials. My name is Melissa Rosen. I'm the Director of Training and Education. I, I want to, again, thank you. Before we begin, we have just a few housekeeping items to share. First, I want to thank our sponsors for today's webinar. Our sponsors en enable us to continue to offer meaningful programs. So thank you to Daiichi Sankyo, GlaxoSmithKline, Immunogen, Merck, and the Sigmund and Edith Blumenthal Memorial Fund. And of course, we are proud to partner on this webinar with Cancer Support Communities Frankly Speaking program. This you webinar is being recorded and will be posted on Charcheret's website, along with a transcript for you to use as a resource. Participants' faces and names, of course, will not be in the recording. And you do have the option to remain anonymous during today's live webinar. You can turn off your camera and even change your name in your Zoom Square. And there are instructions in the chat box as to how to do those now. We've received many really interesting questions through the registration process, but as questions arise during the presentation, please use the chat box and we will address them during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. As a reminder, Sharsherit has been providing telehealth services to the breast and ovarian cancer communities for more than 20 years because cancer is both a physical and a psychosocial experience. If you're interested in finding out about Charcheret's free, confidential, and personalized services, please email us or visit our website, and those are both going into the chat box right now. Before we welcome our main speaker, Dr. Brian Slomovitz, we are so very fortunate to welcome Janet, who is a Charcheret program participant from Sherman Oaks, California, and she credits Ibrand's clinical trial with saving her life. Janet, thank you so much for being with you, being with us today, excuse me, and, and we're so glad you, you could be here to share your story. I am as well. Thank you for inviting me. Um, my name is Janet Klein, and, Klein bleh, and I'm a stage four breast cancer survivor. I was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer in 2009 and was cancer free in 2010. I wasn't totally surprised by the diagnosis as my mother had been diagnosed twice and my sister once. My cancer was found on a routine mammogram, which I did according to my doctor's recommendations. At the time of my diagnosis, annual screenings were recommended. Things have changed quite a big deal, quite a, quite a bit since my experience, excuse me. Today, my daughters go to a high-risk gynecologist at UCLA and either receive an MRI or a mammogram every six months. 12 years later, I'm still cancer-free. The biggest reason I am alive and cancer-free is because some wonderful doctors saw a drug on a shelf in a laboratory, which was designated for another illness entirely and asked the question, why not? I was offered a space in the phase one of the clinical trial of the drug now known as Ibrantz. It worked. Just in case you're not familiar with Ibrantz, it is the most revolutionary discovery in breast cancer treatment since Herceptin in the 1970s. It treats the most common type of breast cancer, which accounts for 65% of all women diagnosed. One thing I learned on my cancer journey that I like to share with other patients and families is that clinical trials for cancer patients do not give placebos. I was given the same standard of care as any other woman diagnosed, but not in the clinical trial, as well as exceptional monitoring. It is very important to be a part of your team. Don't just sit on the sidelines and listen. 
it's ultimately your life being discussed and you should assemble a team that you can work with. Today, I am a happy, healthy wife, mother, grandmother who leads a crazy busy life. Pilates, needlepoint, cooking, and playing with our beautiful grandson, just to name a few. I appreciate the opportunity to share my story of survival and joy through the wonderful Shasherat organization, which can guide and support women on their journey, just like mine. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Your experience really does fill us with hope and, and it's good to hear such a positive outcome. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Okay, as we move into the webinar itself, I also want to remind you that Sharsharet is a national not-for-profit cancer support and education organization that does not provide any medical advice or perform any medical procedures. The information provided by Sharsharet is not a substitute for medical advice or treatment for a specific medical condition. You should not use tonight's advice to diagnose or treat a health problem. Always seek the advice of your physician or qualified health care provider with any questions you might have regarding your specific medical condition. We are so very fortunate to have our speaker with us today, a specialist in clinical trial development, robotic surgery, sentinel lymph node evaluation, and immunotherapy. Dr. Brian Slomovitz is Director of Gynecologic Oncology and Co-Chair of the Cancer Research Committee at Mount Sinai Medical Center in Miami Beach, Florida. He is also a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Florida International University. Dr. Slomovitz is a member of the Board of Directors of the GOG Foundation and Uterine Cancer Lead for GOG Partners. GOG stands for Gynecology Oncology Group, which is a nonprofit organization funded by the National Cancer Institute. He is also the national or global principal investigator on a number of GOG partners, NCI, and Alliance Foundation clinical trials. He authored more than 100 peer-reviewed articles, and lectured extensively. Dr. Slomovitz has been recognized as a top doctor by Castle Connolly Medical for the past several years. Dr. Slomovitz graduated from Rutgers University, New Jersey Medical School, and completed his residency at New York Presbyterian Cornell Medical Center. At MD Anderson Cancer Center, he completed a fellowship in gynecologic oncology, and he is board certified in both obstetrics and gynecology and gynecologic oncology. Wow. Welcome and thank you so much for being with us today. This topic is such an important one. Um, well, th Melissa, thank you so much for the introduction. and um, It's really a pleasure for me to, to be here today and to talk to, to, to your group. I know we have a bunch of people on I think that so far 69 participants, so, which is always exciting. Um, re real quick, I just wanna, you know, what, um, what was said about Ibrance. Ibrance is a um, CDK4-6 inhibitor that's used in breast cancer. Um, it goes after the, the machinery of the cell, which is pretty neat, so there's less toxicity. Um, a lot of what we do in GYN, we borrow from what we learn in breast cancer. And actually right now I'm running two trials looking at CDK4-6 inhibitors. Um, not the Pfizer product, uh, product, but I have one from Lilly that we're working on endometrial cancer, actually, and one from Novartis that we have going on in uh, low-grade ovarian cancer. So yeah, it, it is a great drug, and um, I'm so happy to hear positive stories from it. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about, clinical ca uh, about cancer clinical trials, the importance of trials, and how they really um, you know, set the pace for for beating cancer and, our, the, and how we come up with new discoveries. Until a treatment has a 100% chance of cure, we're not satisfied. I'm not satisfied with um, not doing more, not doing more research in order to make it better for all the patients. Um, so I wanna thank the uh, Chef Sheridan and the 
folks involved for inviting me to speak tonight. And I'm really, uh, it's my pleasure to speak to this group. This program um, is, uh, frankly speaking about cancer, a program of community support. And I'm gonna advance my own slides. Um, here's a disclosure statement about the, um, the presentation. And ju just as a quick point, you know, I, I there's a ton of, uh, not a ton, a bunch of slides here. I want to get through them. I'm going to sort of break some things down into layman's terms. Um, so, because I think that whenever we do a session like this, not only is it important to give you the information that we have here, but the question answer session is, is really crucial. And I just want to, you know, r remind people sort of what was already mentioned. I I'm not going to answer specific medical questions. I'm happy to answer general, general type questions, but you know, a lot of personal questions people have a tendency to ask appropriately, but I'd have to defer them to their own doctor. Um, thank you for the introduction. Here's how I am. I'm at Mount Sinai Medical Center. Um, the GOG Foundation, we lead most of the, the all, all of the large clinical trials, if not most, if not all the large clinical trials in gynecologic cancer. So I'm on the board there and I run all the, uh, or the, my portfolio is the uterine cancer clinical trials for our industry sponsored arm. Um, I have a, a financial relationship as an advisor, a consultant with Novartis. Um, and I also um, failed to list here, Merck, I think was mentioned as one of the sponsors. I'm running two of their trials, uh, two, one global trial, one for the US, and I'm a paid advisor from them as well, but I'm happy to disclose that. So this is an overview of what we're gonna go through tonight of, of this workshop, basically just to define a clinical trial, why they're important, um, how the trials work, how to participate, why um, some of the barriers to participation, um, rethinking what we're doing in the future, and then best ways to communicate with your doctor about trials. And as mentioned, then we're gonna go through a question answer session, um, which is always a, a top part of the program. So tips for living in the strange new land, cancer is the scariest world, it's scariest word, sorry. I diagnosed a woman this morning, um, nine o'clock this morning with a new ovarian cancer and, and it's scary. Um, the, the, the reality of it, the truth of it is scary, um, but we could focus on the fear and the anxiety of it only so long, and then we have to turn the negative into, um, I don't want to say a positive, but we have to turn it constructively, look at the glass half full or three quarters full, and come up with best ways to treat patients so they could live a long, happy, productive life, which, you know, even when the advanced cancers that we treat, ovarian cancer and others, we're getting better and better at treating them. So it's important once the, with a new diagnosis for a friend or family member or yourself is to get educated, to get support. And as mentioned, glass half full, um, to have hope, have hope, courage, get out of bed in the morning. Don't roll over and go back to bed. Get out of bed, have lunch with your friends. Um, go play Mahjong, go to work, do what you need to do. But uh, it's so important to do that. Um, and you know, just, this presentation is, tumor agnostic, so we're not focusing on any one clinical trait, so, um, clinical uh, site of origin. So this is clearly not the gynecologic clinic. Um, it's a male patient. Um, so what is a clinical trial? A clinical trial is a research study that compares a new treatment or approach to the existing standard of care in order to um, come up with new standards, new best practices in order to treat patients in a, in a better fashion. Um, they could be prevention trials, early detection trials, um, adjuvant trials, meaning early stage or tumors that are gone to help keep them away longer. They could reduce the risk of, they could evaluate the reduction of risk of recurrence. Obviously, a lot of trials are looking at advanced stage disease. We're focusing on rare tumors too. It's not only important to study um, the breast cancer and the prostate cancer and the lung cancer, but some of the rare cancers as well. One, one little secret in, in, in GYN, um, we're jealous of pink. We are so jealous of pink because, you know, we have teal in September and, um, and I'm saying this jokingly, so don't take me so seriously, but uh, it is great to make awareness and to study some of the rare cancers as well. Um, so I like to like, say teal and pink are my favorite two colors. Um, some studies look to re reduce the side effects of treatment. And, you know, we're learning it's not only the efficacy that's important, but it's also quality of life, making sure that patients could, again, get up and do what they want to do and have a productive life and also patient reported outcomes. You know, it's important to look at the outcomes that we evaluate, but surveying patients to see how they feel and how they're doing are important part of studies now. Two out of three patients in the US live at least five years after cancer diagnosis. 
um, this is now compared to one out of two in the 70s. The cancer death rate has dropped 18% since the early 90s, um, which reverses decades of increasing. And individuals with cancer are increasingly able to live active, productive lives. So why are they important? Here's a couple of disease sites we could see why they're so important. Um, melanoma and even lung cancer, non-small cell lung cancer. As you know, um, if you watch the Super Bowl, K. Truda, um, immunotherapies, checkpoint inhibitors, they really changed the standard of care. And I'm, I, 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 uh, I mentioned K. Truda, there's also several other companies. So it's not just that one that have a, a checkpoint inhibitor. Um, it's immunotherapy changes standard of care. Um, the, the winner of the last, one of the last Nobel Prizes in medicine helped develop checkpoint therapy for out of M, Dr. Allison out of MD Anderson. New T cell therapies in, in, in blood cancers have a 90% remission. Pediatric cancers, 80% um, of children with cancer are cured of their disease. One of the nice things about pediatric cancers too is there's such a high accrual rate of patients with cancer who get accrued to clinical trials. So something that we're, we're sort of need to model in, other, in our other disease sites. And we already spoke briefly about breast cancer, but adjuvant therapies have really worked and focused on keeping the disease away, have really significantly increased survival rates. Now, there's a lot of words on the slide, and I'm, I'm really not going to read all the words, but what I want to say here is that we're learning more and more that we need to. It's not should we, it's we have to include minorities in studies. We need to do it for a couple of reasons. One is we need to make sure there's an appropriate access to care, that we're providing equal care across all different populations and socioeconomic groups. But we've learned that's not really the most important issue. What we're learning is that cancers amongst different diverse populations actually have different prognoses and have different responses to therapy. So if we're doing a study that um, is, for example, a cervical cancer trial, which, which cervical cancer affects a large number of black women, Hispanic women, Asians, in addition to white patients, we need to make sure that the clinical trials that are being done in cervical cancer have this diversity. So um, it's becoming much, much more important. The other thing that I wanna add here is that we've been doing okay in making it better. The FDA released a broad statement in back in April of this year, uh, basically saying um, a letter sort of to, to a statement towards drug companies, um, pharmaceutical companies, if you want to get FDA approval, you really need to focus on minority accrual, which is really a phenomenal step. A lot of the studies that I'm dealing with, we're actually having um, as a standing agenda item, the role of accruing minorities and, uh, and making sure there's diverse populations um, in all, into all of our clinical trials. And we know that if, and to get FDA approval, they're going to have to play some role in um, a larger role in, 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 the, in the makeup of the trial. Um, we know that of uh, women of, we know that black women may stay out of trials. There's a lot uh, a history for, for some of these is that there's, um, there was Tuskegee experiments back um, many, many years ago, which um, didn't provide standard of care to patients who were injected with syphilis. Um, there's a lot of fear from previous trials. We need to better educate our patients, particularly those of diverse backgrounds, that research now is well re regulated, it, it's ethical, it's monitored by several oversight committees in, in institutional review boards, data safety monitoring boards. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a safer environment um, where most of our informed consents not only are in English now, but they're in Spanish. Um, in Miami, we have a large Creole, uh, Haitian population. So we have them in Creole. In other regions of the country where there's other um, large representation of ethnic groups, we have um, different languages, we have those as well, which is very important. It's difficult to, when someone is, 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 English is a second language or not a language at all, to give them an English consent form to try to convince them that joining a trial is the best thing to do. It's not a very successful way of doing it. Um, other reasons listed here, why minorities are important and why it's, where it's difficult to get them enrolled, to get that group enrolled in clinical trials. Um, also, we want to, you know, a lot of times clinical trials does do offer the best care for our patients. Um, remember, and I'll talk about this in the beginning, the, the placebo effect does is it, it's everyone's afraid that if they get on a clinical trial, they're going to get a drug that doesn't have activity. That's only the case if 
no activity is the standard of care. If the standard of care is a Tylenol, for example, the clinical trial will look at Tylenol plus something else or something else that to see if it could be Tylenol. Not, it, it's not ethical to give no treatment to patients. So I'll focus on that again, but we really have to teach that to all of our patients, not only those of um, diverse backgrounds. Being on a clinical trial um, is the best way to treat cancer. It's offering the latest and greatest treatments in order to help beat the disease. And we really need to emphasize this across um, different populations. Um, why clinical trials are important for treatment. Every new treatment was, was tested in a clinical trial. It can't be FDA approved without going through a clinical trial. Um, the faster that trials find participants, the faster they accrue, the faster they can get to patients off of protocol. Um, we're, we're seeing dramatic changes. The, the FDA is becoming more user-friendly when it comes to FDA approvals. There's something called an accelerated approval pathway, which we've had several gynecologic drugs approved in the last couple of years. Um, newer therapies are more precision-based, based on a better understanding of how cancers arise and grow, and being more unique, individualized towards the patients. And as mentioned earlier, emphasis on quality of life. The problem is, even with all the benefits that we talked about and, and a slew of more benefits, only 4% of adult cancer patients ever participate in a clinical trial, and we haven't been successful in increasing that. Patients who could potentially benefit them are, are unaware. Minorities, as mentioned, are underrepresented. And progress is slowed when trials are unable to recruit patients they need to evaluate. This is a problem that we have to change. And really, frankly, this is one of the reasons why we're having this webinar is to increase the awareness of clinical trials and to encourage when you um, are talking to your family member or your friend or their friends or the patients themselves to encourage them to consider clinical trials. Let's go through the different type of trials um, very quickly. A lot of this is information that some of us may know. Preclinical research, we'll call these phase zero trials, before human lab work, test tube work, pre-animal safety studies, looking for activity in cells to you know, predict that there may be some activity in humans. Phase one are safety trials, first in human trials. Um, these couldn't just, you know, not only side effects or toxicity, some of these trials can also look for efficacy. Um, we found a new treatment with cervical cancer that I'm a co-author of that we uh, reported out in the phase one data, first in human, which showed effectiveness in the few people who had cervical cancer that eventually years, a couple of years later led to an FDA approval of the drug. The goal of phase one is to get those to look at efficacy and safety in this population, of, oh, sorry, safety in this population of patients. And this is what I was discussing with efficacy. If there's an early effective signal, the next stage isn't to say we prove something in a phase one trial. The next stage is to say, all right, there's an early signal, let's move to a phase two study. Phase two trials are looking more at efficacy um, and, and they also look at safety, but efficacy is the looking for the effectiveness of a drug. Um, these usually could take two years and involve a larger number of patients. Some studies are open labeled phase two studies, meaning everyone knows what the patients get. Some are randomized to different treatment arms in order to get a sort of a, a, a baseline, giving the standard treatment versus a newer treatment. This is not like a head to head trial, but we just want to make sure when we come up with benchmarks for the new treatment that it's comparable to that as soon as the older treatment. So these are sort of like contemporary arms of the trial. Then the, 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 the trials that really change the standard of care. As mentioned, this is changing a little bit. Phase two trials can lead to an accelerated approval, which is sort of, sort of like a temporary approval pending a phase three confirmatory trial. So we see some FDA accelerated approvals, but eventually it's the phase three trials that lock in a new drug into becoming standard of care. Again, these are studying the current treatments versus a new treatment or adding something to the current treatments. They are not giving placebo unless, plus, unless no treatment is the current standard of care. Um, the, the, here it says very specific measures of success. The statistical design of these trials is, is, is crucial to make sure that a positive study is positive and a negative study is negative. Um, a lot of smart statisticians get together to uh, put these trials together. And these are the ones that lead to FDA different, um, newer FDA approvals. We're doing a lot of these within the US um, and again, just like anything else, we need to get more patients involved. You may have heard of phase four trials. These are after FDA approval, looking more real world evidence of once a drug's approved, sometimes it's quality of life or, or 
patient uh, reported outcomes, looking at side effects in the real world. Um, but these are ongoing, not as much of a priority because the drug's already approved. Later phase trials are pretty much looking at either overall survival or progression-free survival. Um, if it's in an adjuvant setting, meaning if it's in patients that don't have disease, but they want to see how long it, um, the disease could stay away, then they look at disease-free survival. And occasionally, they look, phase two studies often look at response rates or complete remissions when the, 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 the disease goes away completely. Every person facing cancer should talk to his or her doctor about a clinical trial. Here's one of the problems. Doctors and um, so, there's so many good doctors out there and it has nothing to do with their knowledge. Doctors oftentimes, if they don't have clinical trials in their practice, there may be an inherent resistance or reluctance to send a patient for a clinical trial because Doctors like their patients. Doctors love their patients oftentimes. And to send them away means they're not caring for the patient. We need to overcome this burden, with this hurdle. We need to have patients become more educated to, to challenge their doctors about clinical trials, to be able to tell their doctor, you are my doctor, but I'm going to go to this university or this center to get on a trial and I'll let you, I'll continue to see you. Um, but that, that has to stop being a barrier um, as far as the, uh, uh, to, to resistance and accrual. Um, informed consent trials are ethically run. They're managed by ethic review boards. Everyone has to give informed consent. Um, it's, a, it's a process. It's a, a trial is a cookbook. A large part of the beginning of the cookbook is to explain the trial to the patient and where they're giving the informed consent to make sure they really understand what they're signing up for. One of the important things about informed consent is once you sign up for a trial, you always have the right to drop out of the trial. There's no coercion. There's no forcing. There's no well, you got dose one, you need to get doses two to six. A patient can withdraw informed consent at any time. Um, if it's a surgical trial, they can't wake up in the middle of surgery and say stop. Um, but I'm joking a little bit there, but you, you guys know what I mean. Um, anytime a clinical trial, one other important point, if a clinical trial gets an endpoint sooner than expected, meaning it's a, drug, it's a trial of drug A versus drug B, and sooner they expect it, they find out that drug A is better by a statistical endpoint. The people who run that trial, whether it be the pharmaceutical sponsor, the local investigators, or the government, are responsible for making sure people know the results. And they're responsible for making sure that those patients who received drug B, the lesser effective one, are offered drug A in order to give them the best treatment. So we just don't leave patients hanging if they're sort of randomized to the quote unquote wrong arm they eventually will be get offered the, the best treatments available. How do you find a trial? Talking to your doctor, getting a second opinion, look for a cancer center in your area that does a lot of clinical research. Um, you could, you have to, it, the patient advocacy groups, the Gilda's Club, uh, other, other, other advocacy type groups. These are, you, the patients really need to go out and get the resources necessary and to do their own search to find the trials. Um, personally, in my practice, I have uh, any time about 10 or 12 gynecologic trials ongoing, but I never, ever tell a patient not to get a second opinion if they want one um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, I could always learn something. Um, I've said that more and more earlier in my career, but still, I'm, I'm, I could always learn something. I could learn what trials are going on if I'm not aware of them and um, help me better take care of my patients, um, you know, which is you know, which is an important thing to do. Another reason to get a second opinion is sometimes the centers that we send them to um, have trials open that I may not have in my practice. But patients really need to be their own best advocate. Some tips, clinicaltrials.gov is an online resource for clinical trials. All prospective clinical trials that go on in the United States are required to be listed on clinicaltrials.gov. They're required. So if it's being done in the U.S., it's on clinicaltrials.gov, so it's a good place to look. Cancer Center websites and advocacy groups, as mentioned. In order to find a trial, you need to know what type of cancer you have, the stage, if it's new or recurrent, if you have a certain mutation. Um, so it is hard to find complicated language, very specific eligibility criteria. So you really sometimes need to partner with your doctor, even if it's a doctor who doesn't necessarily offer you trials at the beginning. Um, you know, it's, it, you can talk with him or her and uh, use them as a resource to potentially find the trials that are either in your area or if it's such a unique trial with a great um, 
promise you know to go to a different area of the country to to get onto the trial um, here's a guinea pig myth i taught this is the placebo effect or you know one, part of it is the placebo effect part of it is are we treating patients like guinea pigs you know we talked about this patient there, there's preclinical data to see some of the effects including toxicity there's phase one studies which are very limited population small small studies um, giving in, you know, in sequentially, not necessarily at the same time, to see if a drug is safe because we don't want to treat patients like guinea pigs. Um, one of the other things about clinical trials is there's not only a team of clinicians from the office helping out, but there's also a whole research team looking, um, which is sort of nice. And patients, in my experience, tend to like that in order to get more attention. All trials in the U.S. require that the clinical team truly believes that the therapy being tested might be better. In the standard of care in order to move forward. I talked about this at length, the placebo issues. Um, again, patients have to get an active treatment if one exists. Uh, why don't people participate? Changing doctors or centers, I touched on this. Pa you know, not only the doctors want to keep their patients, patients want to keep their doctors. Patients have established a long relationship with their doctors. They trust them. Um, they know them. They know their family. They know their friends. I always tell my patients who feel, sometimes they question like, oh, Dr. Slum, are you going to be upset if, or I was afraid to tell you, but I, you know, patients worry too much about what their doctors think. Um, you know, I could, I'd like to say, oh, I go home every night and I, before bed, I think about every single patient I saw that day. It's not true. Patients need to do what's best for themselves. Their family needs to guide them. And if a patient comes to me and say, hey, doc, I want to go somewhere else for second opinion, please do. I'm happy to call up the doctor they want to see. Um, let them get a second opinion. Um, truthfully, that approach, most patients come back because they don't feel like they're, they, there's an intimidation factor or a secret factor. And again, I just want to make sure the patients get the best care. And if there's a study at another center, able to go on that trial. Um, cost. Clinical trials, people don't participate because they're worried about the cost of a clinical trial. Here's the bottom line. Real simple. If the cost is not standard of care covered by your insurance, the clinical trials costs need to be covered by the sponsor of the trial. Again, whether that be pharma, whether that be um, the NCI or the local institution, you cannot charge someone. It's unethical to charge someone to reap the benefits of a newer drug in the clinical trial. It's either covered by their standard of care or the pharmaceutical company covers it. People then say, well, I came in, I got all this therapy and I was charged my deductible of 1500. You're gonna to have to pay your deductibles, right? That doesn't change that aspect, but your health coverage is covered. If it's covered by your insurance, then it's covered. The, the, otherwise the, the trial will pay for you. Why people don't um, participate, or we talked about this suspicion or distrust of the medical profession, talked about some historical events that's led to this. Um, there was an old Jewish home in Brooklyn. I forget the exact the, the story. Years and years ago, they used to inject melanoma into patients to see what happens when you inject melanoma into skin. Totally unethical, totally advanced the disease. Um, this was a Jewish old age home. I think it was in Brooklyn back in the 30s or 40s. So that doesn't have, we clearly we don't do that anymore, obviously. Other reasons why people don't participate. Um, they need a good nurse navigator who's in, research nurse navigator to direct patients to educate them, not to force them, but to educate them about clinical trials. It could help facilitate a conversation between the patients and their doctors. It could help lead to conversations could lead to more relevant questions, which could help um, convince the patient that a trial is best for them. Um, and as I mentioned, I talked about second opinions as being a, a, an option. Other reasons why people don't participate, they think that being on a clinical trial is that's their last treatment and they're gonna die if it doesn't work. That's not the case. As I mentioned earlier, we have clinical trials for early detection, um, screening, prevention, um, adjuvant therapy. Yes, some trials are being done to see if there could be you know, a save at the end um, or, or towards the end of one's um, treatment period. But for the most part that these are not last efforts, these are trials that are being done Again, to improve the efficacy, the side effect profile, or the quality of life. Trials bring hope. I'm getting something new. Maybe it's going to work. The most innovative therapies. 
Trials bring excellent care and monitoring. Again, not one team, but two teams. Um, trials, your voice gets to be heard. And you could really contribute to the greater good. You could be part of a trial, as mentioned earlier, being a part of a trial that leads to a new indication of breast cancer. It's for the, for the greater good of all patients. Um, and you feel good about yourself being a part of a trial that really helped change the standard of care. And obviously it could uh, provide a better care for yourself. Talk to your doctors about clinical trials. Bring it up if they don't bring it up with you. Make a list of questions. I always tell the patients, a new diagnosis, go out to the Walgreens or CVS, um, buy one of those composition notebooks, the ones that you can't rip the pages out so you don't miss anything. And every doctor's visit, go with your doctor, go, go with your notebook and write down your, com your answers to your questions. And between doctor's visits, have the notebook around and write down the questions. I mean, I, all the time for me, I think of questions, I'm, that's a great question to ask my doctor or ask someone, whatever. When I go and I have the opportunity to ask clearly, I forget what the question was. Write it down. Um, patients all ask me all the time if they could record the interaction. I'm always willing for them to do that. Um, but you have to ask your doctor. Just don't do that without permission. But most doctors will allow you to do that. Um, if you're offered a trial, take time, think about it. A lot of patients are, are given an informed consent. They don't need to sign it that day. They can take the inform, you can take the informed consent home, read it over with your family, show it to your other doctor if you have one to see what's best for you. No, 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 no coercion. And if you look for trials on your own, discuss what you find with your doctor. It's good to have open communication. Newer models of clinical trials are target are looking at targets, looking at mutations, not necessarily organs. Trials focus on specific genetic mutations rather than cancer types. We're doing more and more flexibility trials, you know, flexibility in trial designs to allow more accrual, to allow smaller studies in order to get the same answers. More effective therapies are being investigated. Um, with the newer, more effective therapies, there's better patient participation. And finally, there's more input from patients and advocates in designing and evaluating trials. These are some of the newer models that we're using. Um, we're getting to the end here. Here's a couple of, uh, here's one helpline, cancer support help, uh, helpline.com. The Gilda's Club is a good resource. There's plenty of good resources out there. Clinicaltrials.gov. Talk to your doctor. A lot of hospitals and cancer centers have their own support groups. Um, it's important to not feel that you're alone. It's important to talk to people that are maybe going through the same thing as you. No one, as a patient, no one could put themselves in your shoes. As a loved one, no one could put themselves in your shoes. So it's important to really openly communicate and get as much help and support as you can. Um, that's what I have. I, you guys have been great as far as um, hopefully listening. We have 74 people, and I'm happy to start answering questions because I know this group is going to have a lot of questions for us. We do. We do again. have a lot of questions, not only the ones that came in earlier, but a lot that have come through the chat box now. So Dr. Slomovitz, I'm going to ask you to unshare. There you go. Unshare your slides. Uh, perfect. Perfect. Um, so I'm just going to get started because we've got uh, a lot and you've given us a wonderful overview of all the things we need to be thinking about and how clinical trials work. So now I would like to ask some more specific, not specific to a particular patient, but more specific about clinical trials in general. Mm -hmm. So um, a couple of them, um, a, a couple of people have asked just very quickly, because we have a lot of questions and not a lot of time, as an example, could you give one or two, like just explain one or two very quickly of the trials you're currently conducting? Sure, it's a great question. So um, I'm doing a trial. So so there's a drug called um, uh, Tibdac is a commercial name. It's it's made by CGen. I was involved with trials uh, through the phase two setting that got an accelerated approval, as mentioned by the FDA, a quicker approval. And then now there's a confirmatorial trial, an international confirmatorial trial, confirmatory trial, sorry, looking at this drug Tibdac versus chemotherapy to confirm whether the Tibdac is better in second line or third line cervical cancer. I'm the, the national principal investigator for the gynecologic oncology group of that trial. So it's an international trial. We're doing it here throughout Europe with our colleagues. Um, with, there's a group in 
Europe NGOT, it's called. It's it's our partner group, GOG and NGOT, we partner. We do a little trials together. Um, and the results of this trial will be confirmatory. If they're positive, then TIVDAC will remain FDA approved. If not, then it will um, not remain FDA approved. But most drugs that have an accelerated approval, clearly there's activity there. So we're optimistic that'll be. Um, I have another trial I'm doing in endometrial, just to mention another one, endometrial cancer, immunotherapy versus chemotherapy, newly diagnosed patients with a particular mutation. How cool would it be if this is a positive trial, we're going to eliminate chemotherapy for advanced endometrial cancer in some patients. I mean, that's like remarkable. That's something I've been fighting for my whole career. Incredible thought. Wow. Thank you for that. Okay. So let me... Um, uh, ask you a couple of other questions. One of them is um, one that I, I, I bet everybody's wondering. So um, can a doctor or can and or will a doctor connect a patient to trials outside of their own hospital affiliations? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the answer number one is they should. But unfortunately, that's not always the case. And it's not always done, it's not done in a malicious way. Sometimes doctors aren't aware of the trials that are available. Um, sometimes it's, it's, I don't want to say malicious, but sometimes doctors don't want to give up patients for a variety of reasons. But this is why we're having conferences like this. This is why patients and their families need to be the best advocate for themselves in order to seek out areas or facilities that have um, clinical trials available. The other thing is sometimes clinical trials, some clinical trials are better than others. So it's not only finding the clinical trial, but finding the best one for yourself. So this, other, this next question, I, I, I think you mentioned this during the, your presentation, but I think it's worth confirming. So somebody asked, if I'm not doing well in a trial, can I return to the standard of care? You did say you could leave a trial at any time, but does being part of a trial make the standard of care not available for some medical reason? No, the, 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 if they want to withdraw from the trial and then decide not to get the current experimental drug, if that's what they're getting, they could definitely, I can't think of any exceptions, maybe there's, but they could definitely go and get onto the standard of care. So definitely. Okay. Great. What goes into a decision where the patient is about to embark on a highly successful treatment protocol, but was offered a clinical trial with less treatment? In other words, the patient was diagnosed, the treatment is very, very effective, um, but they're given an option to have less treatment. How does one decide something like that? That's a great question. And, and, and you know, first of all, this is where a lot of thought and energy is put into the statistical design. The higher the current, the, the higher the effectiveness of the current treatment makes some of these trials very, very, very difficult to design because they have to beat that, that, that benchmark. So, you know, that's one thing. And then we're, you know, so a lot of times it requires larger numbers or sort of a well thought out statistical approach in order to prove that it's better um, is, is one way of doing it. And, um, ultimately, how your, 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 your ultimate question is, how do you decide? And that's easy. The patient decides. Not without getting proper information, not without having the resources available to them. But oftentimes, for example, I'm running immunotherapy trials on, on endometrial cancer. Sometimes the drugs that we're studying are similar to drugs that are already approved. There may be the hope that the, new, the ones we're studying work better than the ones that are approved, but maybe they'll be the same. So patients need to know what the current drug that is approved, the effectiveness, and that'll have be a response rate amongst patients or some sort of activity. And they need to know what we're studying in, this, in, in the protocol, and then they can decide which way to go. Somebody asked about out-of-the-box treatments used for other cancers. This particular caller happens to be dealing with triple negative breast cancer, but this would be a pro, you know, for any type of diagnosis. How do you find out about um, specifically treatments that have already been approved for other diagnoses that, yeah. that are being tested for? Oh, 
So I think you're saying like if it's if breast cancer, if they want to see if a drug that worked for pancreatic cancer may work for them. I think that's what you're yes. alluding to. You know, it's about talking to their doctors. It's about getting second opinions. It's about a little doing a little bit of homework for themselves. Um, and, you know, if it, and, and making sure they're comfortable with the doctor and the doctor's opinions. Again, oftentimes I'm using breast regimens on some of my women with endometrial cancer or low-grade ovarian cancer because they're very similar diseases. Similar, something called a mucinous ovarian cancer, oftentimes I'll use a GI regimen, a colon regimen, because they're very similar, even though it's different disease sites. So it's important to have that outside the box ability. Some the problem there is on some of these examples I'm giving, you also have to get insurance authorization, which sometimes isn't the easiest. So that's another reason if you outside the box on a clinical trial, as mentioned, the costs are, are, are covered. Let me ask you another question to follow up with that. Um, I'm thinking finances, and while the treatment protocols for the trial are covered, I know one of the reasons you mentioned people don't participate is additional expenses. Additional expenses, including um, travel and lodging, during, you know, if you have to travel to get to that. Are those included in any? That, is that, are those expenses included in any clinical trials? That's a great point. More and more we're doing it, not necessarily, and not for a reason of our role for diversity, which one would think, but it's really for our role to get patients in who don't necessarily live near a cancer center. And it could be of any ethnicity or, or any population. Um, you know, we don't entice patients with monetary rewards for, for, a, for participating in a trial, but paying for parking or paying for lunch if they're there all day, or if they come in um, from hundreds of miles away and they need a hotel room, that's not monetary enticement. That's fair market value um, assistance that patients need. So that is being covered more and more. That's good to hear. This next question is something we hear all the time. Um, trials about um, the benefits of aromatase inhibitors or tamoxifen, five years, seven years, 10 years, 15 years. What's going on there? What's the latest research? Yeah, no, so that's a great question. So I'm, I just, you know, for disclosure, I'm not a breast cancer expert. I, I have plenty of trials. I have a trial in sarcoma with aromatase inhibitors. I have a trial in endometrial cancer. Actually, we did a trial in endometrial cancer with an mTOR inhibitor and an aromatase inhibitor that we changed the standard of care. Um, so I use aromatase inhibitors, but you know, from as, as uh, someone somewhat knowledgeable in breast cancer, you know, tamoxifen was a great drug. It really changed just the way we treat patients with um, breast cancer. As um, time went on with breast cancer, we um, aromatase inhibitors were discovered, and that's good for one patients who don't tolerate tamoxifen, or two patients some patients who fail tamoxifen, they can get an aromatase inhibitor. And as far as the timing of it, the, the studies that are being done, you know, the longer time goes on, the more we're learning about how long some of these drugs should, should stay on patients. I think in the chat, I saw, well, what about the osteoporosis associated with aromatase inhibitors? Um, any effective drug has side effects. It does. And I'm not saying to ignore the side effects and, and to go on, but I'm saying that um, we have to look at the side effects, see if there's any quick remedies or easier remedies or relatively easy remedies for the side effects, and then go from there. Um, somebody just put in the chat box, if a drug um, that can be potentially effective, um, I'm just reading this question, I wanna make sure it's right. It's a question about compassionate care. Yes. If someone needs a drug immediately or knows they uh, there might be, um, you know, they might be given standard of care versus the new drug, or they don't qualify for a particular clinical trial. Is there a possibility that oncologists could get a, um, a compassionate care usage that's outside of the clinical trial? Yeah, so, you know, the, the key word in that question is potentially. If there's studies that have shown that it's effective in a certain disease site, then it's easier to appeal to an insurance company to say, we send it, what we do is we print out the study and we send it to them. Here, this study has been done and we, it's demonstrated activity. You know, there's no better options for the patient, so can you give approval? And even with some of the reluctance of insurance companies to give approval, oftentimes in my experiences, we've gotten those approved. Now, if there's, 
if there's a drug that hasn't been used in certain disease sites and there's no report in the literature, um, then it requires a compassionate use. And that's actually, even treating one patient is like a whole research protocol. So it's timely, it's very difficult to do. Um, and, you know, it doesn't mean we can't prescribe it as doctors, but, you know, we can't necessarily pay for it. For example, a lot of times there, there used to be some evidence that metformin prevents endometrial cancer. Not so much anymore, but I'd provide metformin to those patients who came in and asked about it because there's no harm. It could help prevent diabetes. And the cost off of insurance is like 57 cents a day. So that's not a big deal there. But if on these expensive drugs, um, uh, it's more difficult. And then I see Mimi asked about compassionate care versus expanded care. Compassionate care is what I sort of just descri uh, described it to see if, um, if in, a, in, a, in a drug that hasn't been studied in a certain disease site, if we could try to do it, like is the N of one or one patient study and things like that. So uh, um, that's compassionate care. Expanded access is when insurance doesn't cover a drug or a patient doesn't have the resources to pay for it. And it's sort of a financial assistance program. Um, that a lot of companies have in order to help get the drugs to patients. We only have time for a couple more questions. There have been people um, who have asked some somewhat specific questions, but not necessarily uh, medical advice. Somebody asked if you if you were familiar with any current studies that deal with HER2 negative um, breast cancer. Yeah, no, I'm not a breast cancer expert, I'm sorry. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Another person um, asked about, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this one correct, ivermectin, is that, mm -hmm. is, yeah, is that currently still in clinical trials or has it been approved? And if it is still in trials, how can one access that? Is that for COVID? Ivermectin, is that the, what they're talking uh, about? No, it was not. No, oh. they were asking about cancer. You're not familiar. Okay. Um, One so other thing, just one, another example of a trial I'm doing, just to give you guys a sense, in endometrial cancer, we have a biomarker-driven trial. So before we treat patients with a drug, it's actually a six-arm trial. We test the tumor for a specific marker, and then we assign the patients a particular group based on that marker's positivity. So I like to call that sort of like a, a patient-specific or sort of like a smart trial, looking at the mutations in a certain cell and it's the same trial, but they can get one of six arms, not in a randomized fashion, but predicted by the markers in our cells. So this is another way, I know there's I spy 2 and breast cancer is doing the same thing. So there's a bunch of, this is sort of the new next generation of studies um, that are again, smart studies, looking at particular mutations and assigning the treatment arm based on that. It's another example I wanted to mention. Oh, that, that takes it to a whole different level. That's amazing. Yeah, it's really neat. It's really okay. Neat. I'm going to ask, um, or it's not really a question, but I'm hoping you can address it. A couple of people have shared that um, they've tried to engage in a clinical study, or they have engaged in a clinical study, and their experiences weren't positive. For instance, one woman noted, actually I should say one person noted that she was on clinicaltrials.gov, and every time she connected with something that was listed there, the clinical trial wasn't, the trials weren't happening or weren't available. Another person shared that um, she wasn't, she was in a clinical trial. She, they weren't readily given the results. She did find out she was um, in the, the um, group that was the, not the new, the new approach, but the standard of care. And it was somewhat devastating and there was no support for that. She felt they were dismissive. So I, one, I'm hoping these examples are from a little bit ago, but I wondered if you could just speak to that for a moment. So, you know, we mentioned earlier, like the last stitch effort, that's not the case. But when patients are seeking out a clinical trial, oftentimes in their mind, they're really focusing on that trial. They need to be on that trial. Clinical trials are designed in order to get FDA approval and to provide a better treatment for patients. They're designed very carefully and very meticulously with inclusion and exclusion criteria and performance status, how healthy is a patient, in order to standardize the arms as best of ability and in order to say, well, the patient didn't do well because of the disease, not, well, something else was going on. So patients sometimes get frustrated when they're not, this is one point, 
when they're not eligible for a trial because they don't meet the eligibility criteria specifically. And we can't make exceptions because we really need to, you know, the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars are poured into one trial in order to come up with an answer. Um, we're compassionate. We're, we're passionate about what we do. But if the FDA doesn't accept those trials, if we have what's called deviations, then we need to do what's best practices and not include those patients. Um, COVID was a horrible, horrible time for clinical research. Clinical research staff at many large university-based facilities were either um, underfunded, the staffing was redirected towards COVID trials, or the staffing was really um, redirected towards uh, the, the, the redirected towards other areas of the hospital. A lot of them are nurses; they needed help. So that was a tough time to to, to really focus on that. Um, so it's not. I understand people's frustrations in order to um, people's frustrations in order to wanting to be on a trial and then not being accepted. But it's actually, believe it or not, a thoughtful, perfect, uh, purposeful process in order to see who's eligible or not. And it's done in a way in order to best do, do what's best for the patient. I'm looking at this um, about ivermectin. And I, I heard about this in the past, uh, back in May of 2020, so there was a study that showed like in a test tube, um, ivermectin, which is an anti-parasitic drug. Thanks, Andrea, for forwarding it. And um, can uh, prevent uh, um, ovarian cancer from growing. This study that she referred to is published in uh, June of 2020. Two authors from China, where it basically showed that proteomics expression levels looked at different proteins. You know, I'll say in, in the most polite way, this thing's not ready for prime time. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, you know what? Everything starts somewhere, but right now um, it's not something that's, that looks particularly hopeful, maybe yeah. in the future. And, and well, one I of my mentors once, one of my mentors once said, like when we had some ideas that like we said, well, I thought about that five years ago. And it said, well, you were ahead of your time. And so sometimes <laughs> it takes years to mature an idea. That's right. That's right. I wish we had time for more questions, but I am, I'm cognizant of the time. I want to thank you, Dr. Sloan, that's for sharing your expertise with us today. I learned so much and I hope all of you did too. I want to thank once more our generous sponsors, Daiichi Sanko, GSK, Immunogen, Merck, and the Sigmund and Edith Blumenthal Memorial Fund. Thank you to C Cancer Support Community for their partnership on today's program. Please take a moment to fill out a brief evaluation study that is going into the chat box now. You can click that and still listen to the last couple of, of um, notes here. Um, during the next few days, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording, a transcript, and access to some of the resources noted today, as well as some additional Sharsheret resources on clinical trials. So please be on the lookout for that. And please remember that Sharsheret is here for you and your loved ones during this time. We provide emotional support, mental health counseling, and other programs designed to help you navigate through your cancer experience. And as always, all are free completely private, one-on-one. -on -one. Our contact information is in the chat box, but our number is 866-474-2774, or you can email clinicalstaff at sharsheret.org. Finally, we'd love to stay connected with you. Remember that um, we are on social media. We post about events like these, program updates, fun ways to get involved. The links are in the chat. And we have several exciting webinars on a wide range of topics planned over the next few weeks, including a music and movement webinar this Thursday evening meant um, as a, a therapeutic evening for anyone at any point, whether they are in bed, sitting down, actively moving, and a webinar on hormone usage and cancer next week. Check out our website regularly to see what topics are coming up, and that is in the website in the chat box right now. Okay, 
Thank you again, Dr. Slomovitz. Thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Good night. Bye-bye.